Book Two, The Church of Good Society, Part Two, of The Prophets of Religion by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gibson's Preservative. I have a friend, a well known scholar, who permits me the use of his extensive library. I stand in the middle and look about me, and see in the dim shadows walls lined from floor to ceiling with decorous and grave-looking books, bound for the most part in black, many of them fading to green with age. There are literally thousands of such, and their theme is the pseudoscience of divinity. I close my eyes, to make the test fair, and walk to the shelves and put out my hand and take a book. It proves to be a modern work, a history of the English prayer book in relation to the doctrine of the Eucharist. I turn the pages and discover that it is a study of the variations of one minute detail of church doctrine. This learned divine, he has written many such works, as the advertisements inform us, fills up the greater part of his pages with footnotes from hundreds of authorities, arguments and counter-arguments over supernatural subtleties. I will give one sample of these footnotes, asking the reader to be patient. I add the following valuable observation of Dean Good, on Eucharist, 2, page 757. See also Archbishop Ware in Gibson's Preservative, Volume N, Chapter 2. One great point for which our divines have contended, in opposition to Romish errors, has been the reality of that presence of Christ's body and blood to the soul of the believer which is effected through the operation of the Holy Spirit, notwithstanding the absence of that body and blood in heaven. Like the sun, the body of Christ is both present and absent, present, really and truly present, in one sense, that is, by the soul being brought into immediate communion with, but absent in another sense, that is, as regards the contiguity of its substance to our bodies. The authors under review, like the Romanists, maintain that this is not a real presence, and assuming their own interpretation of the phrase to be the only true one, press into their service the testimony of divines who, though using the phrase, apply it in a sense the reverse of theirs. The ambiguity of the phrase, and its misapplication by the Church of Rome, have induced many of our divines to repudiate it, etc. Realize that of the work from which this valuable observation is quoted, there are at least two volumes, the second volume containing not less than 757 pages. Realize that in Gibson's Preservative there are not less than ten volumes of such writing, Realize that in this twentieth century a considerable portion of the mental energies of the world's greatest empire is devoted to that kind of learning. I turn to the date upon the volume, and find that it is 1910. I was in England within a year of that time, and so I can tell what was the condition of the English people, while printers were making and papers were reviewing, and bookstores were distributing this work of ecclesiastical research. I walked along the embankment, and saw the pitiful wretches, men, women, and sometimes children, clad in filthy rags, starved white and frozen blue, soaked in winter rains and shivering in winter winds, homeless, hopeless, unheeded by the doctors of divinity, unpreserved by Gibson's preservative. I walked on Hampstead Heath on Easter Day, 
when the population of the slums turns out for its one holiday. I walked, literally trembling with horror, for I had never seen such sights nor dreamed of them. These creatures were hardly to be recognized as human beings. They were some new grotesque race of apes. They could not walk, they could only shamble. They could not laugh, they could only leer. I saw a hand organ playing, and turned away. The things they did in their efforts to dance were not to be watched. And then I went out into the beautiful English country. Cultured and charming ladies took me in swift, smooth motor-cars, and I saw the pitiful hovels and the drink-sodden, starch-poisoned inhabitants. Slum populations everywhere, even on the land. When the newspaper reporters came to me, I said that I had just come from Germany, and that if ever England found herself at war with that country, she would regret that she had let the bodies and the minds of her people rot, for which expression I was severely taken to task by more than one British divine. The bodies and the minds, the rot of the latter being the cause of the former. All over England in that year of 1910, in thousands of schools, rich and poor, and in the greatest centers of learning, men like Dean Good were teaching boys dead languages and dead sciences and dead arts, sending them out to life with no more conception of the modern world than a monk of the Middle Ages, sending them out with minds made hard and inflexible, ignorant of science, indifferent to progress, contemptuous of ideas. And then suddenly, almost overnight, this terrified people finds itself at war with a nation ruled and disciplined by modern experts, scientists, and technicians. The awful muddle that was in England during the first two years of the war has not yet been told in print, but thousands know it, and some day it will be written and it will finish forever the prestige of the British ruling caste. They rushed off an expedition to Gallipoli, and somebody forgot the water supply, and at one time they had 95,000 cases of dysentery. They always muddle through, they tell you. That is the motto of their ruling caste. But this time they did not muddle through. They had to come to America for help. As I write, our Congress is voting billions and tens of billions of dollars, and a million of the best of our young manhood are being taken from their homes, because in 1910 the mind of England was occupied with Dean Good on Eucharist and the ten volumes of Gibson's Preservative. THE ELDERS What the Church means in human affairs is the rule of the aged. It means old men in the seats of authority, not merely in the Church, but in the law courts and in Parliament, even in the Army and Navy. For a test I look up the list of bishops of the Church of England in Whitaker's Almanac, it appears that there are forty of these functionaries, including the archbishops, but not the suffragans, and that the total salary paid to them amounts to more than nine hundred thousand dollars a year. This, it should be understood, does not include the pay of their assistants, nor the cost of maintaining their religious establishments. It does not include any private incomes which they or their wives may possess, as members of the privileged classes of the empire. I look up their ages in who's who, and I find that there is only one below fifty-three. The oldest of them is ninety-one, while the average age of the goodly company is seventy. There have been men in history who have retained their flexibility of mind, their ability to adjust themselves to new circumstances at the age of seventy, 
but it will always be found that these men were trained in science and practical affairs, never in dead languages and theology. One of the oldest of the English prelates, the Archbishop of Canterbury, recently stated to a newspaper reporter that he worked seventeen hours a day and had no time to form an opinion on the labor question. And now, here is the crux of the argument, do these aged gentlemen rule of their own power? They do not. They do literally nothing of their own power. They could not make their own episcopal robes. They could not even cook their own episcopal dinners. They have to be maintained in all their comings and goings. Who supports them, and to what end? The roots of the English church are in the English land system, which is one of the infamies of the modern world. It dates from the days of William the Norman, who took possession of Britain with his sword, and in order to keep possession for himself and his heirs, distributed the land among his nobles and prelates. In those days, you understand, a high ecclesiastic was a man of war, who did not stoop to veil his predatory nature under pretense of philanthropy. The abbots and archbishops of William wore armor, and had their troops of knights like the barons and the dukes. William gave them vast tracts, and at the same time he gave them orders which they obeyed. Says the English chronicler, Stark he was, bishops he stripped of their bishoprics, abbots of their abbacies. Green tells us that the dependence of the church on the royal power was strictly enforced. Homage was exacted from bishop as from baron. And what was this homage? The bishop knelt before William, bareheaded and without arms, and swore, Here, my lord, I become liege man of yours for life and limb and earthly regard, and I will keep faith and loyalty to you for life and death. God help me. The lands which the church got from William the Norman she has held, and always on the same condition, that she shall be liege man for life and limb and earthly regard. In this you have the whole story of the Church of England, in the twentieth century as in the eleventh. The balance of power has shifted from time to time. Old families have lost the land, and new families have gotten it. But the loyalty and homage of the Church have been held by the land, as the needle of the compass is held by a mass of metal. Some two hundred and fifty years ago a popular song gave the general impression. For this is law that I'll maintain, until my dying day, sir, that whatsoever king shall reign, I'll still be vicar of Bray, sir. So, wherever you take the Anglican clergy, they are Tories and Royalists, conservatives and reactionaries, friends of every injustice that profits the owning class. And always among themselves you find them intriguing and squabbling over the dividing of the spoils. Always you find them enjoying leisure and ease, while the people suffer and the rebels complain. One can pass down the corridor of English history and prove this statement by the words of Englishmen from every single generation. Take the fourteenth century. The good parliament declares that unworthy and unlearned caitiffs are appointed to benefices of a thousand marks, while the poor and learned hardly obtain one of twenty. God gave the sheep to be pastured, not to be shaven and shorn. And a little later comes the poet of the people, Piers Plowman. But now is religion a rider, a roamer through the streets, a leader at the love day, a buyer of the land. 
pricking on a palfrey from manor to manor, a heap of hounds at his back, as though he were a lord, and if his servant kneel not when he brings his cup, he loreth on him asking who taught him courtesy. Badly have lords done to give their heirs lands. Away to the orders that have no pity. Money reigns upon their altars. There, where such parsons be living at ease, they have no pity on the poor. That is their charity. Ye hold you as lords, your lands are too broad. But there shall come a king, and he shall shrive you all, and beat you as the Bible saith for breaking of your rule. Another step through history, and in the early part of the sixteenth century, here is Simon Fish, addressing King Henry the Eighth in the Supplication for the Beggars, complaining of the strong, puissant, and counterfeit holy and idol, which are now increased under your sight, not only into a great number, but into a kingdom. They have begged so importunately that they have gotten into their hands more than a third part of all your realm. The goodliest lordships, manors, lands, and territories are theirs. Besides this, they have the tenth part of all the corn, meadow, pasture, grass, wool, colts, calves, lambs, pigs, geese, and chickens. Yea, and they look so narrowly upon their profits, that the poor wives must be countable to them of every tenth egg, or else she getteth not her rights at Easter, shall be taken as an heretic. Is it any marvel that your people so complain of poverty? The Turk now, in your time, should never be able to get so much ground of Christendom. And what do all these greedy sort of sturdy, idle, holy thieves? These be they that have made an hundredth thousand idle whores in your realm. These be they that catch the pox of one woman and bear them to another. The petitioner goes on to tell how they steal wives and all their goods with them, and if any man protest they make him a heretic, so that it maketh him wish that he had not done it. Also they take fortunes for masses and then don't say them. If the abbot of Westminster should sing every day as many masses for his founders as he is bound to do by his foundation, one thousand monks were too few. The petitioner suggests that the king shall tie these holy idle thieves to the carts to be whipped naked about every market town till they will fall to labor. CHURCH HISTORY King Henry did not follow this suggestion precisely, but he took away the property of the religious orders for the expenses of his many wives and mistresses, and forced the clergy in England to forswear obedience to the Pope, and make his royal self their spiritual head. This was the beginning of the Anglican Church, as distinguished from the Catholic, a beginning of which the Anglican clergy are not so proud as they would like to be. When I was a boy, they taught me what they called church history, and when they came to Henry the Eighth, they used him as an illustration of the fact that the Lord is sometimes wont to choose evil men to carry out his righteous purposes. They did not explain why the Lord should do this confusing thing, nor just how you were to know, when you saw something being done by a murderous adulterer, whether it was the will of the Lord or of Satan, nor did they go into details as to the motives which the Lord had been at pains to provide, so as to induce his royal agent to found the Anglican Church. For such details you have to consult another set of authorities, the victims of the plundering. 
When I was in college my professor of Latin was a gentleman with bushy brown whiskers and a thundering voice, of which I was often the object, for even in those early days I had the habit of persisting in embarrassing questions. This professor was a devout Catholic, and not even in dealing with ancient Romans could he restrain his propaganda impulses. Later on in life he became editor of the Catholic Encyclopedia, and now when I turn its pages I imagine that I see the bushy brown whiskers and hear the thundering voice, Mr. Sinclair, it is so because I tell you it is so. I investigate and find that my ex-professor knows all about King Henry the Eighth, and his motives in founding the Church of England. He is ready with an economic interpretation, as complete as the most rabid muckraker could desire. It appears that the king wanted a new wife, and demanded that the pope should grant the necessary permission. In his efforts to browbeat the pope into such betrayal of duty, King Henry threatened the withdrawal of the Annets and the Peter's Pence. Later on he forced the clergy to declare that the pope was only a foreign bishop, and in order to stamp out overt expression of disaffection, he embarked upon a veritable reign of terror. In Anglican histories you are assured that all this was a work of religious reform, and that after it the church was the pure vehicle of God's grace. There were no more holy idol thieves holding the land of England and plundering the poor. But get to know the clergy, and see things from the inside, and you will meet someone like the Archbishop of Cashel, who wrote to one of his intimates, I conclude that a good bishop has nothing more to do than to eat, drink, and grow fat, rich, and die, which laudable example I propose for the remainder of my days to follow. If you say that might be a casual jest, hear what Thackeray reports of that period, the eighteenth century, which he knew with peculiar intimacy. I read that Lady Yarmouth, my most religious and gracious king's favorite, sold a bishopric to a clergyman for five thousand six hundred pounds. She betted him the five thousand pounds that he would not be made a bishop, and he lost and paid her. Was he the only prelate of his time led up by such hands for consecration? As I peep into George the Second's St. James, I see crowds of cassocks pushing up the back stairs of the ladies of the court, stealthy clergy slipping purses into their laps, that godless old king yawning under his canopy in his chapel royal, as the chaplain before him is discoursing. Discoursing about what? About righteousness and judgment? Whilst the chaplain is preaching, the king is chattering in German and almost as loud as the preacher, so loud that the clergyman actually burst out crying in his pulpit, because the defender of the faith and the dispenser of bishoprics would not listen to him. End of Book Two, Part Two